I'm fairly late to the political world, unlike some that get into it. Um, my background's in engineering, heavy engineering, mining. Um, but I left that and went by way of youth work in central Liverpool in the late 70s, early 80s, and then uh, trained for the church. And for 37 years, I was a, a church minister, um, though some of that I was serving in industry based at Coventry Cathedral. So it's been a strange journey. Um, I retired eventually in 2017. I joined the party in 2009, um, persuaded to do so by a post that Caroline Lucas put up, which is basically saying that it's all very well campaigning. Um, campaigning is great, but at the end of the day, the people who actually take the decisions are the people who have their hands on the leaves of power, and those are politicians. And unless you've got politicians who are green, you know, you can campaign for all your worth, but it won't work. In other words, the green movement needs a political wing. And I thought, that's right. I've been involved, I've been thinking around green issues, certain since I left the mining industry, the coal mining industry <laughs> in the early ages. Um, and I've done quite a lot of sort of theological reflection on it and all that sort of stuff. Um, it was a major sort of theme, but that was a challenge to put some of this into, into action in a political world about which I knew very little. I uh, joined the party in 2009 and um, uh, later that year, I was living in Summertown at the time and uh, later that year, uh, a party member down the road, Nick Lee, knocked on my door and said, they're looking for a candidate for Summertown for the election uh, in 20." 10 it was and I thought blimey well I only joined the party <laughs> a few months ago um, but I've been very warmly received at the party meetings in fact I've been invited to chair a couple and I thought well okay now it would have been a kind of paper candidacy in a way that is one in which you don't stand much chance of being elected um, the election was going to be a shoe in for the Lib Dem um, stalwart Gene Fuchs um, who would, was going to be elected. Uh, but I thought to myself, well, you know, Gene could go under a bus. Um, I better not say yes and, unless I'm prepared to do the job. So I said yes. Uh, and then in January, I think, I got a visit from our then party organiser to say there's a bit of a hiatus with the candidacy in St Mary's Ward in East Oxford. I thought, well, that's interesting because that's a rather different kettle of fish. That's had Green Party candidates for uh, councillors for a while. So I thought about that and thought, well, well, in for a penny, in for a pound, and let my name go forward. There was a kind of hustings meeting. I won't go into the details of that, but any, anyway, I ended up sort of being narrowly selected uh, by kind of one vote. And then I thought, well, I thought the Green Party worked by consensus. This isn't a consensus. So I then spent some time talking to everybody, those who had not put my, my name forward as a candidacy and those who had, and eventually felt that there was enough support for me to, to run. I did and um, got elected. But it wasn't quite as simple as that. Um, I didn't really have any idea at the time what was involved in getting elected because I knew nothing about the political machine. I was a bit surprised, was told, well, unless you knock on every door in the ward, you're not going to get elected. I thought you're joking, surely, but no, that's what you did. Um, and uh, in, in St Mary's, there was a, a well-oiled, I would say, machine, electoral machine, um, and I was very happy to let them get on with organising that, and I'd never got into organising elections since. Um, it's not really my cup of tea. I let other people do all the decision making. I just do what I'm told. Um, what I can do is stand on door doorsteps and talk to people. And I enjoy doing that. I'm a bit shy. Um, so it's a bit ooh -er knocking on the door, even though I've done it probably 20,000 times now. But once the door opens, I'm, I'm fine. And enjoy it very much. And I've never had anybody say anything rude to me over the doorstep. It's been a pleasure, to be honest. Just a pity it has to happen in the cold months of the year. Um, yeah, so there we go. And back in 2010, squeezed in by, by 70 votes over the Liberal Democrat of all things. This was the election in which uh, Nick Clegg had come to Oxford and promised 
uh, abolition of tuition fees to all the students at a big meeting up in Brooks. And so all the students were turning out to vote Lib Dem. And we just scraped in, um, which caused a great lot of anxiety for the Lib Dem candidate at the time, who in his own mind was a paper candidate, had no intention of doing a job. And he saw the votes piling up and thought, oh shit. <laughs> so he was much relieved when I got elected. So then it was in the deep end. Um, in those days, we had a green group of councillors um, who met every fortnight to plot what they were going to do at next council. Um, a lot of that went over my head. It was full of acronyms. I didn't have a clue what was going on. But I used to go to that before I was elected. I'm very glad I did. So that when I actually did get elected, um, I, at least, I at least got some grip on, on how the thing worked, what the acronyms were, what some of the big issues that were around because I really hadn't a clue, to be honest. Um, and we had, I think it was eight councillors at that time, by golly. Um, and we've been down to two until the recent election. So um, I was then, I mean, an experienced public speaker. I mean, having been a church minister for 37 years, I'm not, not averse to standing up and speaking in public. That isn't an issue. Um, as regards knowing what the hell is going on, that's a very different matter. Uh, and for that one, I was very much dependent on the group. There is no way I could have served really as a councillor without at least uh, a couple of people around who knew what they were doing. Once I understood what the game was, what we needed to do, what the point of the motion was, what we needed to achieve on this committee, no problem. You know, I, I, I can handle that, I know what I'm doing. Um, so there we go. I'm, I'm not a campaigner by nature. Um, I'm more of a backroom operator, committee person, happy to work on committees, working behind the scenes. Um, a bit of a politician in the sense I'm, you know, I believe that you have to make compromises if you're a minor, minor party. There's a bit of that has to happen in order to, to get something to happen. Um, so, uh, but I had people around me who were definitely campaigners, I mean, irrepressible campaigners. And so they were people who were good at doing that. And, and I've never been one of those particularly, but I think I've had my uses. The general role, the general um, task of being a councillor, I suppose there's three, maybe four dimensions to it. One is uh, the bread and butter, I suppose, which is um, being an interface between um the people who elected you in your ward and uh, the council you're the go-between in some sense you represent the council to them uh, and sometimes you do have to explain that what they want isn't actually going to be achievable whatever um more often it's the other way around you're representing them to the council and contacting officers and say oi this one needs looking at and by and large they tend to give you some attention when you're a councillor so that that's quite useful don't Quite a bit of casework, which for me is a bit water off a duck's back because of being a church minister for all those years, sorting out people getting to a mess and that stuff is kind of second nature in a way. So that's one bit. And that's not very part, it's not very political, not very party political anyway, very rarely party political. Um, then there's the uh, job of um, scrutiny I suppose you'd call it being an opposition uh, and the function of opposition isn't just to shout at people um, but actually to scrutinize what the administration is doing uh, drill down into it find out what what it's doing whether it actually knows what it's doing um, challenge where it's making mistakes challenge decisions and say is that really the best way of going forward so in a way you could argue that we're, we're a labor council in Oxford you know that role is actually helping Labour to be better. To, you know, if they make promises and they don't deliver on the promises, your job as opposition has said, you promised to do this, you haven't done it. Um, so really they should be deeply grateful. Um, some of them who are very rabid political animals, very tribal, have great difficulty un understanding that that's what the role of opposition is because they think it's all about fighting political battles and winning. And so when you ask a question or make a suggestion, they take it as a personal insult and decide to sort of, you know, try to make it a party political thing in that sort of way. Well, that is another part of the job, of course, which is proposed, which is putting forward continually through motions and things, an alternative vision. Um, 
you know, last budget meeting, you want to invest 20 million pounds in commercial property. Is that a very sensible decision when you could be investing 50 million pounds because you can borrow it in solar farms, for instance, which are crying out for investment at the moment. So, you know, where you're really flagging up that Green Party has a different agenda um, and would do things differently. So there's, so there's that. Um, I suppose the last bit is, is the statutory function of the council, um, which in the city council being a district council, the, that is the licensing and the planning functions, which are statutory. And those committees are supposed to be uh, non-party political. I've always had my suspicions about whether decisions are made in Labour group about some planning applications, but of course you can't even dare to say that in a meeting, you get shouted down. Um, they are statutory functions and there you, you, you have to operate um, with a, an open mind on those decisions. The formation of planning policy, that's a different matter, but once the policy is fixed, you're there. Uh, to help implement those uh, and make the right decisions. So that's the four. So that's representing constituents, um, th the task of opposition, which actually can be helping the, helping the administration to be better and keep to their promises. The task of, of, of the political, party political task of putting forward alternative visions and then the statutory um, role uh, of licensing and planning and, and Ian's case on county will be has got other dimensions as well. I think that's perfectly enough for me to give an overview of, of what it feels like to me. What it feels like is another matter and you can ask about that <laughs> uh, later. Uh, Dick could you tell us something about the other part of your work uh, working for residents casework and that's and local issues? Yes you're gonna you're gonna make sure of of stuff. I mean, I haven't had much in the way of uh, immigration and asylum um, cases to deal with. Mental health is 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 one that pops its head up fairly regularly. Um, you can imagine East Oxford um, has quite a number of people with mental health issues. We've got about five um, sheltered accommodation places and stuff like that. Uh, and people who've had um, problems with mental health living on their own you know who get into trouble they don't pay the rent properly or they don't pay the council tax and and when they get letters you know they just bin them and it just gets worse and worse and the officers at the other side don't really realize what it is they're dealing with until they've got bailiffs at the door and stuff like that you know and, and quite often these things are very simple to sort it's just a matter of knocking heads uh, in, in the office saying, listen, you know, you've got somebody who's not coping here, for God's sake, you know, just don't treat them as if they, you, you need to have a bit of common, you know, dealing with that. And generally, you know, we succeed, that sort of thing. Um, planning um, is is always one, neighbour's got a planning application in, I don't like it, do we do? And that's one where sometimes there's a solution, sometimes there isn't. I mean, it could be that neighbour is, is, is building something which is a complete appalling nightmare, hasn't got planning permission, and it's a matter of getting the enforcement people in to say, you are going to have to take that down. That's only happened once. Uh, getting the enforcement out was very difficult when we only had, in the, in the whole city, one enforcement officer. Um, so planning issues like that. Um, uh, planning is, 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 is quite frustrating. A lot of people seem to have the idea that um, planning decisions are made by officers sort of in, a, in some kind of vacuum on a whim or their own personal preferences. And they don't really appreciate that the point where you begin to get involved in planning is at the point at which the planning policy is set because planning is policy led and, and the planning officers will apply the policy. Um, so, I mean, at the moment, for instance, in, it's just outside my ward, you know, we've got people trying to campaign against some housing on a plot of land um, and stuff. Uh, and they're coming up with ideas as what you could use the land for. I'm thinking, for God's sake, the city council owns this land. So, you know, you can't tell the landowner what to do with it. And it's in the local plan. It's got outline planning permission and had that, has had that for four years. And prior to that, there was two years of public engagement 
where were you then? You know, but of course, that's not how people, they don't realise that the time to get involved in planning is when the policy is being formed. By the time you get to the state they're in now, there's very little room for manoeuvre. And it's very difficult as a council to say, well, look, you know, I sympathise absolutely. I wasn't, I miss, you know, when the planning policy was being formed, this isn't in my ward or anything. I didn't spot that one. It's there now. You're room for removal, you know, fight winnable battles. You might manage to save a badger set, you know. I've got my doubts about that, having been in a training session on biodiversity only two days ago. Um, you might be able to reduce the density of the housing that, you know, it's kind of stuff like that. So there's helping people to understand what, what their winnable battles are, parking, controlled parking zones and things like that, which is actually a county issue, but we quite often pick that up. Um, those are the sort of things I think I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think now on other ones I've dealt with other, other things you know you get involved in when you realize actually this is about um, stuff that actually isn't anything to do with the council and they just want somebody to help just like in the old days they went to the priest and then they didn't go to the priest they went to the doctor and now sometimes they go to the local councillor um, I don't mind <laughs> <laughs> I'll help anybody. I mean, a, 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 a really a, a sort of telling example, I think, which is really quite interesting. Case: A, a woman with ment mental health difficulties lost her mother um, after many years caring for her, not coping with it very well, but not realising that she wasn't coping it, with it very well. Living in a place, um, a, a, a council property, an old property, um, which she recently moved into, which she felt was absolutely filthy. Um, the previous people had dogs. She kept seeing dog saliva everywhere, dog hairs. You know, I would look at this and I couldn't see anything at all. Um, you know, it looked fine to me. She had an issue. But the officers, of course, were applying the book rule. This passed the test X, Y, Z. Um, you know, and inflexibility there. And she was totally inflexible on her side. It actually ended up with me, uh, uh, you know, I was thinking, for God's sake, woman, get a bucket and clean it yourself. You know, that's what I do in my house. And it actually ended up with me on my hands and knees with a mop and bucket, scrubbing her kitchen while she watched. And then telling the officers that I had done that. Um, so, you know, she could see that she could have done that. The officers knew that the councillor had been on his hands and knees and they should have bloody done it. And she ended up with a new kitchen. So, you know, it can be... You know, and I quite enjoyed it, but it was exasperating as well. Um, it has no, it gains you no political brownie points at all. <laughs> she might have voted green, maybe, but she thought I was a Lib Dem at the end of it all. So, you know, you don't get any political brownie points for that. Uh, she won't talk to her neighbours about how that local councillor helped her out. You just do it because somebody's, I mean, I don't know where she was going to end up it was not heading in a good direction. Um, so you can get involved in, in all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, yeah, it can be very rewarding. 